we are live. Welcome to 2022's Obi-Wan Kenobi review mini, or possibly just season one show. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And we are going to dive right into the plot. So, yeah, this is set 10 years after the events of Revenge of the Sith about 10 years before the events of A New Hope, and we follow Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I am not going to go into too much detail about exactly what happens, but yeah, the, yeah, I, th I think that is all I will say for now about the plot. So the writing, yeah, this had a series of different writers. Oh, oh, never mind. Actually, not that many. Joby Harold, Stuart Beatty, Hossein Amini, apologies if I got that pronunciation wrong, Hannah Friedman, and Andrew Stanton wrote this show. And there are some issues with the writing. There are a handful of major occurrences where... It kind of feels like the writers are not really taking into account that the story is set in the Star Wars galaxy. Things will be resolved in a way that suggests that they forgot. There are also a couple of things where it seems like they thought that it was set around the same time as A New Hope rather than 10 years before. You know, there are some huge differences between these two time periods. Characters will act out of character, including established characters. There's some very sloppy writing, and it's hard to ignore that this was supposed to be a movie, and they didn't really have good ideas for how to stretch it into a limited series instead. If this had been a movie of about two hours, it would have been a lot less repetitive and a lot more satisfying. And, yeah, so the pilot is good. There are, you know... The show more or less got worse as it went, or maybe it was just that, you know, I started to dislike the show more as it went, but it had a good opening. The, the pilot episode is legitimately promising. And honestly, like, the finale has some stuff that really, really works. The... The thing with finales is that they are final, especially if this only gets the one season. And since it was relatively negatively received by a lot of people, including big Star Wars fans, not only the racist ones, the uh, there's some chance that this is not, you know, yeah, this is this is the last time we're going to see a number of these characters. And considering that, it just it feels like they. There's, there's some wasted potential there. And, yeah. Um, this is technically both a sequel and a prequel. And as a sequel, it does do the, you know, the thing you want of adding some depth to the world. You know, following up on compelling things, you know, putting established characters into in interesting new situations. But as a prequel, it gets that, you know, there are things in this where you can really tell that they have to be careful not to break the canon. And there are some things that are like, it seems like they're kind of trying to explain why are these particular things this way compared to, you know, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, it just, it isn't really that, yeah, it's, it's frustrating. The direction, this was directed by Deborah Chow, who also directed, 
uh, yeah, she's she's directed other science fiction and such. She directed two episodes of The Mandalorian, Chapter 3, The Sin, and Chapter 7, The Reckoning. And, yeah, the there's, there's some really great direction, but honestly, the fact that it was one person directing six episodes... <sighs> Uh, don't let people convince you that it's a six-hour show. I don't know why people are saying that. It's it's not. No, none of the episodes are an entire hour. Yeah, I, I don't know why people say that instead of just saying upwards of... So if I had to guess, I'd say maybe five hours or so. Maybe a little more than that, but definitely not six hours. But yeah, the fact that she directed that many episodes on her own might account for some of the wonky direction that she was just exhausted or yeah but the there is some really great direction some of the some of the performances which you know is a combination of the direction and acting some of the performances are excellent and some scenes really grab you as well. Which brings us to the characters. Ewan McGregor returns as Obi-Wan Kenobi, having played the character in all three prequel movies. And yeah, it's... You know, we're, we're seeing him closer to Alec Guinness's portrayal from the original trilogy than the prequel trilogy. And... Yeah, I, th there's this quote from Wikipedia. This is, I believe, yeah, this is what McGregor, Ewan McGregor said about the character. The character being rather broken, faithless, beaten, having somewhat given up. And yeah, that's an interesting thing to do. I wish they did more with it, but it's a good place to start. That's part of why the pilot is so great. It is isn't really a spoiler to say that Hayden Christensen reprises his role as Anakin Skywalker slash Darth Vader in this. I'm not going to say exactly what happens with him, but I do think this really helps dispel the myth that it's Hayden Christensen who can't act. You know, he gives a really strong performance in, in this show. And, you know, as he has elsewhere, the, the prequels were partially down to George Lucas. I love, I, th I think he's responsible for some of the best movies ever made, including A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. And he certainly did make Return of the Jedi a movie. But he's not great at directing actors. Uh, and and that shows in the in the prequel trilogy. But yeah, Hayden Christensen, I I do think that if you really love Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen in their roles in the prequel trilogy, I would argue that it is worth giving this show a chance. If you at some point just find it very frustrating, don't expect it to get much less frustrating. It might. You know, there are a couple of things where it seemed like it was going to get extremely bad and they did, you know, things got somewhat better. Th that's another thing. This is a show that would, I already mentioned that it, you know, it was supposed to be a movie, but then Solo tanked. And this is a show that suffers from the padding and the cliffhanger because they, you know, they released an episode per week. They gotta get people interested in coming back a week after. And that means you have five episodes that end... I'm not gonna give away whether they all end on cliffhangers, but all of them end on a note of, don't you want to come back next week to see what happens here? And you don't have that problem with a two-hour movie that you're supposed to watch in a single sitting. And yeah, some of the parts where they... Like, there are episodes of this show where it just kind of feels like, oh, they just kind of stopped at a point they thought was kind of interesting, but it didn't really resolve the, the, 
you know, the, the, what the episode was doing, it just kind of, well, you know, the, the next part is definitely a good place to start the next episode, so I guess we should stop this episode here. Yeah. And, yeah, this sees Joel Edgerton return as Owen Lars, Bonnie PSA, I'm gonna go, go with, returning, I'm pretty sure she also played, yeah, as Baru White Sun Lars, and, yeah, you know, Luke's aunt, aunt, nah, uncle and aunt, in, in that order, this helps flesh out the, the characters in a way that, like, in the prequels, they're kind of there, but they don't really, yeah, yeah. They don't get a lot of character. They're they're there because they're there in the original trilogy, and Lucas really wanted by the end of Revenge of the Sith, he wanted for things to be, you know, left in a way where you could, you know, you could go directly to A New Hope, and you wouldn't be like, wait, how did that happen? You know, and yeah, you know, uh, Joe Ledgerton. At the time, he wasn't well known. He's since shown he's incredibly talented, and yeah, he he brings that here. It it it's a characterization that feels consistent, consistent, you know. But yeah, adds depth, and yeah. Now Moses Ingram plays Riva, or the third sister, a ruthless, ambitious inquisitor, and. The let's see, yeah, creator show creator Joby Harold believed Reva would contribute to the legacy of Star Wars villains in a really interesting way, while Ingram described her as a full on athlete and a badass. Now, I personally really liked her character, I thought she, I thought the acting and writing really worked well for you know, it's not flawless, but it's it's quite good in my opinion some people really hated her character and some people took it as far as directing death threats and racist hatred towards her which led to Ewan McGregor actually making a video where he said come on we're better than this if you know if you love Star Wars you're you're okay with diversity which is just like I I find it amazing that there are racists who claim to love Star Wars because they clearly don't get it. Like, watch the original trilogy and just <clears throat> try to count how many of the good guys, you know, are exactly the same. The, the, the whole point is that we are stronger because of our diversity. We are not weaker because of it. You know, the good guys win because they are so different from each other, and the bad guys lose because they're so single-minded, they're so certain that they're always going to win because of their superior technology and a greater number, you know, but they, yeah, it's, you know, and, and them embracing hatred and violence for the sake of power doesn't exactly help matters, but yeah, like, I don't, I'll grant that, you know, for a while it looked like Billy D. Williams as Lando Calrissian was the only black guy in the universe, but they're, they're diverse, and I also saw people saying, you know, what's with the female empowerment in the show? Did you forget about Leia? Because it seems like you forgot about Leia, like, she was a badass in all three of the original trilogy, she she is completely vital to the success. Like in all three movies, like again, watch the movies again, and and this time, like, try to actually notice these things because they're there. They're not even subtle. Like, a new hope. She's the one with the plans. She's the one who gets them out of the. You know. They're they're standing there like, oh, I don't know what to do. We're we're trapped in this hallway, I guess. And she's like, okay, whatever. 
she, you know, she, she shoots a hole and, you know, okay, the garbage uh, compressor almost kills them, but they get out of it, and it's not like they were going to get through the hallway past all those stormtroopers. In Empire Strikes Back, it's her who senses Luke and saves him, and, like, if you're, if you're going to claim that they would have won Episode Six without Luke, just don't even, don't even bother. Like, I, you're never going to convince me of that. And in episode six, she's the one, you know, she befriends the, the Jawas and the, the, you know, yeah, she, she shoots a stormtrooper at a key moment on the, the, uh, and, and or I believe it's, yeah, you know, there are, yeah, there, there, I, I hope that the, the, you know, the, the actress and Disney are not put off by the, the the racists who don't deserve Star Wars because they clearly don't actually yeah you know it, it's just in general if, if you're spewing hatred towards someone who's done nothing wrong you shouldn't have nice things just yeah the the like if you disagree with the acting. Don't send death threats and don't be racist. If you disagree with the writing of the character, that's not the actor, that's the the writers of the, you know, yeah. And I should have looked up how to pronounce this. I, I'm gonna go with Indira Varma. I don't, I'm not gonna give away exactly what she plays, but she's also great. And Rupert Friend plays the Grand Inquisitor. And, like, I haven't watched the animated shows yet. I will get to them. So I didn't know. And, and I also haven't played uh, Fallen Order, I want to say it's called. So I didn't know the Inquisitors before watching the show. I really, really liked the, the Inquisitors on, on this. I understand why people have wanted them to show up in live action uh, for years now, you know, and yeah, like Rupert Friend in The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, he plays a very intense Nazi in Hitman Agent 47, he plays Agent 47, and then in this, like, the Inquisitors, if you want a historical reference, they're the Gestapo, basically, and, you know, the, the Inquisitors hunt Jedi and Force sensitives. And, yeah, like, he just, he is, I, it feels like such an insult to say, he seems like a great guy in real life, he's not actually a Nazi, he's just really good at playing one on TV and in movies, and just, he talks in this very specific way, which highlights that while he can threaten people and he gets their attention with no effort, he doesn't actually have to, to get into the, the filth and actually threaten people directly. Because people know that when you see an Inquisitor, you answer their questions. And it's just, it works incredibly well. I... I you know, having not watched the anime shows, having not played the game, I don't know if that's how they talk in there as well, but it works incredibly well for this show. I loved his screen time. He is just so compelling to watch. And Sung Kang plays the fifth brother. And Kumail Nanjiani shows up as well. So, you know, if you have been paying attention to these names, you can tell... These are, you know, this is another, there's, there's diversity in, in the casting, and I really appreciate it, and I think it helps to inform some of these characters, and just, and it's not like, oh, you know, they just hired whoever, no, these are incredible actors, you know, so, yeah. Let's see, so, let's, yeah, so. The show has the problem the prequels typically do, having to keep canon intact whilst making things tense, telling a story that is compelling, but where we can understand why we've never heard these things before. So that's a big constraint. 
but it does also have the opportunities that a prequel does, making things we already know resonate stronger, adding layers to that. And it doesn't take full advantage of these opportunities. It does some stuff really well. And yeah, just too much focus of this show is given to characters being in danger that we already know will survive. And not enough focus is placed on the interesting new characters that the show does give us. There is some really good fleshing out of characters that we knew before but didn't know that much about. Yeah, the show does interesting things with characters new and old alike. And... Yeah, some of the characterization is quite strong. We see some of the characters in tremendously varied circumstances. Like, we see what they're like when things are going well. We see how they respond to things going wrong. And, yeah, so, the cinematography for the show was handled by Chung Hoon Chung. And they have 28 movie credits for cinematography. They only have four for TV, but that is still quite a... yeah. And, you know, there are other science fiction credits and... oh, right, they... They shot Stoker, which... I'm not saying that movie's flawless, but the, the, photog the cinematography is unreal. Like, just, it is, it is a gorgeously shot movie now let's see right and you know last night in soho and let's see 2003 old boy so yeah this is you know tremendously talented cinematographer and the cinematography is mostly great, but at times it is a mixed bag. There's some incredible talent on display. I don't think any of the shots that are meh are the fault of the cinematographer. Clearly they knew what they were doing. It seems more like some producer interfered. I've heard a theory that it was because they felt that the show was getting too dark. And when you look at some of the other Disney Star Wars, that does make a lot of sense. That seems like they have a difficult time letting the artists do their jobs. Like, they're worried about selling toys. They don't want some, you know, they don't want a Batman Returns situation where, you know, some parents, you know, let their voices be known that their kid cried at the movie. So, no, we're not buying, you know, and they were, like, angry and fairly understandably so. That is not really children's movie. And it's, like, I don't know what they were thinking, telling Tim Burton, do whatever you want. You know, here's a here's a blank check, do whatever you want with this. I mean, have you not seen his the movies he's made that are not for children? Like, he's not exactly the most child-friendly when you don't keep him on a leash like they did with the original Batman. Yeah. Disney Star Wars, they're worried about things getting too dark, and they they really got to figure out adjusting expectations with their artists before they get into production, because this happens, this, ha this also happened with Rogue One, it happened with Solo, you know, they, they ended up losing a bunch of money, especially on Solo. And it's just, yeah, they keep... I, th I think for Solo, it wasn't because it was getting too dark. But, yeah, they didn't adjust expectations. You know, they they said, let's hire these two comedy directors. They'll make a Star Wars movie and have it be a little funnier than usual. And the comedy duo were like, we make comedies. I guess we're making a comedy that takes place in the Star Wars galaxy, and suddenly the producer's are like, okay, this is not working out. Yeah, I, I really hope they get better at, at this in, in the future, because, yeah, this show really feels like they had to tone things down, and, yeah. This show features some incredible introductions for characters and very frequently matches the mood they're going for. While it can get dark, it isn't always, and, you know, action scenes are very distinct from non-action. I did see one critic say that the show is never cinematic. I wouldn't completely... I, I don't agree with that completely, but... I can understand why, you know, some people do feel that. 
The editing was handled by Nicholas Detoff and Kelly Dixon. And they both have a lot of experience. The let's see, Nicholas has edited 19 movies. One in post-production. Kelly has edited 15, you know, she has 15 TV credits. Which, you know, it doesn't mean oh, she she edited 15 episodes. No, she she edited 27 episodes of Breaking Bad alone. So yeah. She edited for 15 different shows, this being one of them. And the editing, by and large, the show is well edited. But there are a couple of instances where there is very awkward editing, very choppy. And my theory is that for those instances, there was simply something that was deleted after it was filmed. Thus, it was, you know, it was too late for them to go back and film something that would cut together better. Overall, it's not a huge issue, but there are some scenes where it just completely takes the the wind out of like the you know they're they're building really nicely the the you know the editing is very competent and then suddenly there'll just be this like really abrupt edit that's disorienting and yeah I I just I gotta I gotta in my uh, imagine I gotta imagine that that was the cause of this issue because the it's clearly not that they just th this show has a, a wealth of talent uh, you know behind it and I, f I feel really bad for for the times that it makes them look bad because it's clear it I would be extremely surprised if it was the cinematographers and ed the cinematographer and the editors who were to blame for the the stuff that is yeah it, it really feels like producer notes which i don't hate disney star wars i think some of it is great but they really got to get better you know it ain't easy being a fan of disney star wars and I hope that changes. I hope it gets easier to make a case for why Disney Star Wars is worthwhile. So the action, I mean, a lot of the time, this isn't really a show to watch for action. You know, some of the characters are out of practice and or there are rules that they shouldn't get into fights. It's not that there's no action. But it might be underwhelming for a number of people, considering the characters and Star Wars in general. Like, <sighs> okay, this is gonna sound completely wild, but there are action scenes in this that are almost as bad as the, you know, the Book of Boba Fett. Not all the action is bad. There's some incredible action in that show, but when that show has bad action it's pretty bad and yeah sometimes this show gets you know way too close to that for for comfort there are some really great action scenes but i really would not like if you if you watch star wars for action i really wouldn't say this is a show for you it's just yeah Th there is a decent bit of tension though and that is obviously also a big part of the appeal of star wars now the score you know john williams if i uh i forget if he actually composed new music for this or it's that some of his old work is used again i i'm not 100 percent sure but I really don't need to say the sentence, John Williams is incredible at scoring Star Wars, so, ah, oh crap, I just said it, but yeah, the, and, and other score in, in this is also great, there's, you know, there's some really suspenseful, tense music, which does a lot to, to have, you know, the, I, I read once that one of the, best ways to scare an audience is through their ears and yeah this this show does really great that there's some great sound design which again star it's it's star wars it wouldn't be star wars if there weren't great sound design 
and we do meet a couple of new, you know, at the end of the day, it's probably to sell toys, but yeah, there are some cool new, I suppose I shouldn't give away whether we're talking about aliens or droids, just, yeah, there, there's some really cool stuff. Too much of the show is very reminiscent of the movies. It really feels like they were worried that if they didn't, if if they strayed from the movies, people would really hate it. And I mean, considering the amount of hate that some of it was deserved, that some of the sequel trilogy got for going in a different direction. Yeah, I can understand why they were concerned, but it still led to the, the show being less interesting than, yeah. So I would say the, the best element of this is the exploration of some themes that are, that we've seen in Star Wars before, but we're seeing them in a, in a slightly different way. The worst aspect is the, the, padding the the repetition and yeah the the biggest criticism i've seen from others is that it just doesn't feel big enough like it's for for star wars it's just unimpressive now the thing i was most worried about was that it just wouldn't have that much to add have that much to say and ultimately, I do think... I'm, I'm not unhappy that I watched it. I mean... If you're not... If you don't love Star Wars, this is definitely not a show for you. And even if you do love Star Wars, like, seriously consider if you really think... You know, like, like I said earlier, Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen give incredible performances in this, and if you love them playing their characters, yeah. Now, uh, let's see, yeah. The thing I was most looking forward to was Hayden Christensen, you know, proving how incredible an actor he is. And, yeah, the show definitely delivered on that. And, yeah, so I've already talked about the pilot and the finale, the overall season is is good. Not great, but not terrible either. Like, if, if you don't feel like watching the whole thing, you know, if you know someone who has watched it, just ask them to, to tell you what to skip. Now, the trailers do give a little bit too much away, but, you know, so goes with trailers these days. They do give you a pretty good idea of what the show is like. So, that brings us to the ratings from other people. And I should have copied this in before, but I'm looking it up now. Yes, so the average tomato meter for this show is 67%, and the average audience score is 63 percent and I think there is some oh and this actually says that it's certified fresh not only fresh and uh, is there really not more detail I guess there's not more detail than that okay that brings us to Metacritic which sees them voting. Yes, so that has a 73 out of 100 based on 19 critic reviews and a 6.9 based uh, user score based on 17 uh, 1798 ratings. And I am just really quickly going to see so let's see. Overall there are Wow, okay, so there's got to be like a thousand reviews. I didn't... Yeah, there's a hundred per page, and there's ten pages. So, that's... Ah, 915. So, yeah. And, so, you know, 
what I'm getting at is the the engagement was pretty good. On IMDb, it has a 7.2 out of 10, which is based on the votes of 96,693 IMDb users. 23.5 gave it 10, 18.88. Let's see, 14 .2, 7, 13.6, 9, 8.5, 6, 6.4, 1, and 5.65. And the user reviews, let's see, yeah, so the, the ones voted most useful, I see a lot of them are very negative, yeah, so... And, yeah, so, yeah, just real quick, if you don't already have Disney+, Plus and you're considering getting it, whether for this show or any other reason, if you are a Star Wars fan, it does have every single live-action movie. Oh, I th I'm pretty sure it has all the animated shows, and, yeah, it has all the live-action shows. Are, were there live-action shows? Of Star Wars before Disney Plus, I think there were some there were some spin-off movies of Ewoks, but not shows. Anyway, and you know the original trilogy has a huge amount of special features. So, but yeah, I recommend this to people who really want more of Obi Wan as played by Ewan McGregor. Anakin slash Darth Vader as played by Hayden Christensen. And yeah, you know, other than that, completists and maybe not purists. Nothing wrong with being a purist. Nothing wrong with not being a completist. So yeah, I rate this seven stretched out movies out of ten. And yeah, so... If someone I knew who was a Star Wars fan waited until all episodes came out before watching it and like called me up and was like, Do you wanna watch it together? Yeah, I could I could do that. I'm not like bitterly crushed by disappointment over the show, which some people are. I I saw someone on YouTube say that they were done with Star Wars and yeah. But yeah, the the I I could watch it again. I could watch it again soon. But if like nobody else, like yeah, other than if someone else wants me to watch it with them or something, I think it might be a long time before I I watch. Certainly the the whole of it, I might rewatch scenes. But even that, I'm I'm not sure about. Let me know. Was this the show you were looking for? And yeah, please hit me up in the comments letting me know. Did you think this show was amazing? Did you think it was terrible? Did you think it was somewhere in between? What should have been different or what was especially good about it? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which these days is Ms. Marvel. And you might not be surprised that I also did one on, you know, since a couple of days ago was the premiere of the finale of this show. I've also just recorded a video talking about that episode where I go into spoilers. And recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, although, you know, for movies, the thoughts will be in the same video instead of in separate videos since its running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.